This lecture is on chapter nine, articulations. What are articulations? Articulations are the unions of two or more bones. The ends of bones are shaped so that they fit together. Less stable joints are more movable because the bones fit loosely together. More stable joints are less movable because the bones fit tightly together. The elbow is a hinge joint, allowing the arm to bend and straighten. These are stable joints because the bones fit tightly together. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint, which allows the greatest range of movement, which means it is a less stable joint. Joints are classified based on structure and function. There are three structural classifications of joints. Fibrous joints contain a fibrous membrane. Examples include gonfices and sutures. Gonfices hold the teeth in the jaw, and sutures connect the facial and cranial bones. Cartilaginous joints contain fibrocartilage. Examples include the intervertebral discs and pubic symphysis. The intervertebral discs connect the discs in the vertebrae, and the pubic symphysis connects the pubic bones. Synovial joints contain a cavity filled with a thick synovial fluid, and all freely movable joints are synovial joints. Here's an example of a gomphosis in figure A. The periodontal membranes will hold a tooth to the bony jaw, and the tooth is not supposed to move, so this is a synarthrosis. The sutures are not supposed to move either, which are featured in figure B, because they connect the bones of the skull, the facial and cranial bones. The amphiarthrosis are slightly movable fibrocartilaginous joints, and the pubic symphysis is featured here between the two pubic bones and the intervertebral discs is featured between the body of the vertebra. Featured to the right is a synovial joint. Notice that the cavity contains a fluid called synovial fluid. We'll talk mostly about synovial joints in today's lecture. There are three functional classifications of joints. Synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses. Synarthroses are immovable joints. Amphiarthroses are slightly movable, and diarthroses are freely movable. Syn means fused together, or together, basically, and so synarthroses are movable. They're generally fused together. Amphiarthroses are slightly movable because amphi means between, so this is between an immovable and a freely movable joint. Dia means thorough or complete, and so a diarthrosis has thorough or complete movement. This illustration shows that the more stable the joint, the less mobile it is. And then the more mobile a joint, the less stable it is. And so fibrous joints pictured in pink are synarthroses like the sutures mentioned earlier. The ones in purple are amphiarthroses, meaning they're slightly movable, such as the intervertebral joints. The synovial joints in blue are freely movable, and the knee and shoulder are pictured here. As mentioned, we'll talk mostly about synovial joints in this lecture. There are six main structures of synovial joints. There's a joint cavity, the synovial fluid, and the synovial membrane. These are all located within the synovial joint. So let's talk about those first, then we'll move to the exterior structures. So the joint cavity is the potential space, and it is filled with synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is an oily, viscous fluid that provides lubrication shock absorption, and nourishment to the joint. Synovial fluid will contain glucosamine, chondroitin, and hyaluronic acid, along with other proteins. 
You may have seen glucosamine, chondroitin, and hyaluronic acid supplements for joint health, and this is why. Synovial membrane is the simple squamous epithelium that secretes the synovial fluid. The synovial joint is the main focus of this chapter, and the exterior structures are the articular capsule, the ligaments, and the articular cartilage. The articular capsule surrounds the entire joint, the ligaments connect the bones together, and the articular cartilage reduces friction between articulating bones. So the articular capsule is going to be a dense irregular connective tissue much like what is seen in the dermis of the skin. The ligaments will be dense regular connective tissue. So the ligaments have a more limited range of motion than the articular capsule. The articular cartilage will be hyaline cartilage and it is going to be found on the proximal and distal ends of the bones. And it helps to reduce the friction as those bones move. There's also something that articular cartilage does called weeping lubrication, where it will secrete its own synovial fluid when um, compression is placed on the bones and the joints. So here we see the features of the synovial joint going from the interior or deepest to the exterior or most superficial structures. We'll start with the actual joint cavity itself. And it is filled with that thick synovial fluid. Synovial means egg-like, ova, egg. And so it's kind of the consistency of an egg white, the synovial fluid. And then the synovial membrane is pictured in pink, and that's that simple squamous epithelium that secretes the synovial fluid. The synovial fluid is actually a filter of the blood. Um, you also see the articular cartilage that is going to surround the proximal and distal ends of the bone, and it's reducing that friction between the bones as they move. The joint capsule is the exterior most in light blue, and then between all of that, you see the thick white structures of the ligaments. Those are those collagen fibers that are dense, regular connective tissues. There are accessory structures found amongst most synovial joints. Bursa will be fibrous sacs that contain synovial fluid. They reduce friction between adjacent structures during joint activity. Tendon sheaths are elongated bursa that surround muscle tendons. They are common where several tendons are crowded together within narrow canals. Fat pads act as a packing material and provide protection. This illustration shows bursa and tendon sheets. As you can see, the bursa acts like a ball bearing and as the joint moves, the bursa rolls between tendons and ligaments, reducing friction between them. And the tendon sheets will do the same thing. They are elongated bursa that will wrap around the tendons. Some synovial joints have a meniscus. Meniscus is a large C-shaped fibrocartilage located in a few synovial joints such as the knee. A meniscus will provide shock absorption and extra stability in the joint as it forms an articulating surface. It also reduces compression because it's fibrocartilage. Synovial joints rely on the following for stability. Articular surfaces are the shapes formed by the bones. A good example is where the humerus articulates with the ulna to make the elbow joint. And this relates to the bone markings mentioned in the previous chapter. Ligaments will prevent undesirable movements. There are both intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments. Intrinsic ligaments are associated with the articular capsule and extrinsic ligaments are outside of the capsule. So in this illustration that we just went over, these would be intrinsic ligaments on the interior of the articular capsule. 
Muscle tone is the continuous pull of muscles on the tendons and bones, and it is the most important stabilizing factor. And it's another reason that it's a good idea to maintain good muscle structure so that muscles can be ready to react when needed, and they can also help to stabilize the bones of the skeleton. Let's talk about the movements of synovial joints. Movement occurs when muscles contract. Remember, the bones act as a lever, and when the muscles put tension on the bones, moving them when the tension is high enough to overcome the resistance. Movement types are generally paired with one being the opposite of the other. So flexion will be paired with extension, as seen in this illustration. The biceps brachii will contract to flex the elbow joint, and the triceps brachii will contract to extend the elbow joint. The range of motion will vary across the different planes. Motion will occur along the frontal or coronal planes, the horizontal or transverse planes, the sagittal planes, and even the oblique planes. The range of motion of a synovial joint can be measured by the number of planes in which they move. Non-axial joints do not move in any plane, and an example of this is the carpals will glide over each other as you wiggle your wrist, but they will not move. A uniaxial joint moves in one plane only. For example, the elbow will move in the sagittal plane. The biaxial joints will move in two planes. For example, the knuckles will move in both the sagittal and frontal planes. And the knuckles are where your phalanges articulate with your metacarpals. The multiaxial joints will move in more than two planes. For example, the ball and socket joints of the shoulder and hips will move in all four planes in a process called circumduction. This illustration shows the uniaxial elbow joint. It is only moving in the sagittal plane for flexion and extension. The biaxial knuckle joint will move in two planes. It will move in the sagittal and the transverse plane. You can see the knuckles can do extension and flexion. They can also do abduction and adduction, which will define those terms momentarily. The plane joint between the carpals is a non-axial joint. It just glides. The head of the humerus is a multi-axial ball and socket joint and will move in all four planes in that process of circumduction, which is basically drawing a cone in space. There are six types of synovial joints named for their movements. Plane joints and hinge joints and pivot joints Condyloid joints, saddle joints, and ball and socket joints. Plane joints are non-axial and perform those gliding movements, such as in the carpals. Hinge joints are muniaxial and will perform flexion and extension, seen in the elbow. The pivot joints are uniaxial and they will perform rotation. Good examples are the atlas and the axis when you are rotating your head in the no position. And then the radius and humerus when you are doing pronation and supination. Condyloid joints are biaxial and perform flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, as mentioned in the knuckles. When you flex and extend the knuckles, and then basically you um, move your fingers away from the midline of your palm and then towards the midline of your palm. That's abduction and, and adduction. Saddle joints are biaxial and they perform opposition. The pollux or thumb is the example. Opposition is when you can touch your pinky finger to your thumb and your thumb to your pinky finger and then also your ring finger, your middle finger, and your index finger. Ball and socket joints are multiaxial and they perform flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, basically that whole circumduction that I was mentioning where you draw the cone in space and even a bit of rotation. Some examples here are the shoulders and the hips. Of all of these, the ball and socket joints are the most freely movable. 
The illustration on top shows the pivoting motion of the atlas and the axis. That transverse ligament allows for that to occur. Uh, then the bottom illustration shows pronation and supination. Pronation is when your palms are facing posterior. Supination occurs when the palms are anterior. This illustration shows all six of the types of joints. A is the pivot joint. B is the hinge joint. C is the saddle joint. D is a plane joint. E, a condyloid joint and F, a ball and socket joint. Arthritis means the inflammation of a joint. Arthro is the joint and itis is inflammation of. There are over a hundred different types of arthritis and all will affect the movement of the joints. The examples include bursitis, which is inflammation of the bursa, pictured in the bottom left picture. Tendinitis is inflammation of the tendons, pictured in the bottom right, and this would be known as tennis elbow. Other examples of arthritis include osteoarthritis. This is the inflammation of the synovial joints from wear and tear. It is the most common type of arthritis and results in the degradation of the articular cartilage. Rheumatoid arthritis is the inflammation of the synovial joints due to an autoimmune disease, and it is hereditary. The joints will eventually fuse together. This illustration shows um, a healthy joint up at the top left, and in the middle of the top left is osteoarthritis, and then the top right is rheumatoid arthritis. On the bottom is just like a further illustration of what the joints look like. And rheumatoid arthritis in the late um, stage usually uh, occurs or, or presents with the deformities in the joints, such as the swan neck deformity of the fingers and a boutonniere deformity of the thumb. Gouty arthritis occurs when high uric acid levels settle into the blood and form needle-like crystals that settle into the joints. This one is usually caused by diet. Lyme disease is bacterial and is transmitted from a tick. If left untreated, it can cause arthritis. Sometimes joint injuries occur because the soft tissues of the joints can hold the joints together for a limit. So cartilage uh, tears can typically occur with the, when the meniscus is subjected to compressure and sear stress at the same time. Sprains occur when ligaments are stretched or torn more than 6% beyond the maximum limit. Dislocations occur when the bones are forced out of alignment. And dislocations can lead to further injury down the line as the soft tissue is stretched and weakened. Movements of joints are angular, rotational, or other. Angular movements will increase or decrease angles between two bones. Angular movements include flexion and extension. Flexion will decrease the angle between the bones and brings the bones closer together. For example, using the elbow to bring the forearm towards the upper arm. Extension will increase the angle between bones. For example, using the elbow to take the forearm away from the upper arm. If the joint is extended more than 180 degrees, this is called hyperextension. So when looking up at the ceiling, that is hyperextending the neck. Lateral flexion will occur when the trunk of the body bends laterally away from the midline. Figure A shows flexion and extension of the neck with hyperextension looking up. Figure B shows flexion and extension of the arm at the elbow joint. Figure C shows flexion and extension of the wrist and hyperextension when pointing the fingers towards the sky. Figure D shows flexion and extension of the knee 
and figure E shows lateral flexion of the trunk of the body. More angular movements include dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion occurs when the ankle joint bends, so the dorsum or superior surface of the foot will move towards the leg, for example, pointing the toes towards the ceiling. Plantar flexion occurs when the ankle joint bends, so do the dorsum of the foot moves away from the leg, for example, pointing the toe towards the floor. Abduction and adduction occur in tandem. Abduction is the lateral movement of the body part away from the midline, and adduction is the medial movement of the body part back towards the midline. So for abduction, I always remember abduct means to take away. So examples of this are when the arm or thigh is moved laterally away from the midline. With adduction, I remember we're adding it back to our body. So example, when the arm or thigh are brought back toward the midline. Figure A shows abduction and adduction of the arm. Figure B shows adduction and abduction of the wrist. Figure C shows abduction and adduction of the thigh. And figure B shows adduction and abduction of the fingers. Circumduction is going to include the following motions, and it's seen at the ball and socket joints that are multiaxial. So with circumduction, the proximal end of the appendage will remain relatively stationary, and the distal end will make a circular motion, and this movement will make an imaginary cone shape. Rotational motion occurs when a bone pivots on its own longitudinal axis. Lateral rotation turns the anterior surface of the bone lateral, and medial rotation will turn the anterior surface of the bone medially. The example is shown in figure B there with the arm. So the um, arm is turning lateral in the top illustration and medial in the bottom. Pronation is the medial rotation of the forearm, so the palm of the hand is posterior. Supination is the lateral rotation of the forearm, so the palm of the hand is anterior, and that's pictured down in figure D with pronation on the left and supination on the right. Also in figure A, you're seeing the rotation of the atlas and the axis. And then in uh, figure C, you're seeing the lateral and medial rotation of the lower leg. Other movements include eversion and inversion. Eversion occurs only at the ankle joint and turns the sole laterally. Athletics will use pronation interchangeably with eversion. Inversion occurs only at the ankle joint and the sole turns medially. The athletics will use supination interchangeably with inversion. And this is important because when we walk, some of us tend to walk with our ankles everted, and some of us tend to walk with our ankles inverted. And this can lead to issues with the knees and the hips and even the lower back, uh, even the you know plantar fasciitis. And so a lot of shoes and insoles will work to correct whatever you know problem that you have as a result of walking everted or inverted or pronated or supinated as will be used in athletics. For example, I walk supinated. I tend to walk on the outer um, arch of my foot, the lateral arch of my foot. Sorry if you hear me sniffling. I must have allergies today. <laughs> All right, we've got protraction and retraction now, depression and elevation. And these are pictured here referring to the jaw. So with protraction, it's the anterior gliding movement of the jaw, as you can see on the bottom left. Retraction is the posterior gliding movement of the jaw, as you can see in the bottom figure to the right there. Um, then depression and elevation, uh, the lady in that illustration is uh, elevating the mandible with her mouth closed, depression of the mandible with the mouth open. 
Another thing that um, the jaw can do is uh, glide side to side, like laterally. So the jaw is a um, less stable joint and is often dislocated. Uh, this is an illustration showing opposition in a little more detail. As I mentioned, it's the movement of the thumb towards the tips of the fingers, starting with the, um, you know, uh, pinky, then ring, then middle, then index. And only primates can do that. All right, so let's look at the anatomy of the selected synovial joints as we wrap up the chapter. All joints in the body are important. There are a few, though, that have more clinical importance due to their movements of focal areas and the severity of injury if they are impaired. So we're going to first look at the atlanto-occipital joint and the atlanto-axial joint. The atlanto-occipital joint is found between the occipital bone of the skull and the atlas or C1 vertebra. The atlanto-occipital joint allows nonverbal communication of looking up, looking down, and nodding the head, yes. The atlanto-axial joint is found between the atlas, or C1 vertebra, and the axis, or C2 vertebra. The atlanto-axial joint allows nonverbal communication of looking over the shoulder and rotating the head, new. No. And so birds have a very loose atlo uh, Ax atlanto-axial joint because they can look like all the way over their shoulder and even tuck their little bird beaks under their wings when they go night-night. All right, so here is the atlanto-occipital joint, and you can see the posterior view of the spine. And then in the middle illustration, um, you can see the occipital condyles of the um, occipital bone and how it... Um, will articulate with the superior articular facet of the atlas. This is also showing the atlatoaxial joint where the atlas and axis um, will articulate with the inferior articulating facet of the atlas and the superior articulating facet of the axis. <laughs> All right, then we see the temporomandibular joint or TM. J. And you might suffer from a condition called TMJ or know somebody who does. And this is usually when the um, joint frequently dislocates and can cause pain when moving the mouth. So the temporomandibular joint is the hinge joint of the lower jaw, the mandible, where it articulates with the temporal bone. And this allows the hinge movement of depression and elevation of the mandible. Also, the gliding movements, as mentioned, protraction, retraction, and even side to side. So it does often dislocate anteriorly, and um, it can cause a whole bunch of problems with chewing. Um, it can cause like all kinds of things, headaches, ringing in the ear, this and that and the other, teeth aches. All right, this is the TMJ joint, and you can see the um, occipital condyl, uh, excuse me, moi, the mandibular condyl of the mandible here, where it will um, articulate with the um, mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. I haven't thought of that word in a long time. <laughs> and uh, then there is the uh, articular disc in between, kind of a little bit like a meniscus, and then the synovial fluid in between. And this is showing the side-to-side -side movements of the mandible. So the movements of the mandible in this way are unique to mammals, uh, which allows us to chew our food. The mammals have different kinds of teeth, like the... Um, incisors and um, the canines and molars and premolars. Um, other animals do not have that. So like lizards, they all have sharp teeth, no mandibles or um, molars or anything like that. But I digress. Let's move on. The glenohumeral joint is the shoulder joint. So that's our next joint there. We're moving um, 
you know, inferiorly now down from top of the head with the, uh, well, the neck with the cervical and then the jaw and now we're at the shoulders. So head, and shoulders, knees and toes, basically. So the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint is multiaxial. It's a ball and socket joint and it is the most freely movable joint of the body. And the enhanced mobility is offset by a loss of stability. Thus, shoulder dislocations are common. Primary support from the joint comes from the rotator cuff muscles. And as you are aware, I'm sure you know that this is a very common injury, is rotator cuff injury. So the rotator cuff muscles are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. <coughs> Pardon me. And these are all located uh, near the scapula, particularly, as you can see, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus are superior and inferior to the spine of the scapula. And the subscapularis is located uh, deep to the scapula. Uh, the rotator cuff muscles are easily torn and injuries are common. So if you do rotator cuff surgeries one day, you will always have patience to come in and need your help. Here we see the anatomy of the glenohumeral joint, and the gleno is going to be this little glenoid uh, cavity area here. You can see it on the scapula. It's very shallow, and it's where the head or proximal end of the humerus will articulate. But they do not articulate, um, you know, stably. <laughs> this is... Um, freely movable. And so here are all of the ligaments and such that are holding this joint together. And then here are the rotator cuff muscles. You see the supraspinatus and infraspinatus shown on the posterior right shoulder and their relationship to the spine of the scapula. And then you see the teres minor one of my students earlier called it the bra strap muscle. That's how she could remember where it was. Um, and then looking at the anterior right shoulder, you can see the subscapularis that's deep to the scapula. And um, the part of the scapula feature would be called the fossa. Scapular fossa. All right, now we're moving distally uh, down to our elbow. And this is the humeral ulnar joint or elbow joint. It is a hinge joint, allowing flexion and extension of the forearm. The articular surfaces are highly complementary. However, ligaments and tendons may become damaged by excessive use or weight-bearing activities. As I mentioned earlier, that's generally called tennis elbow. So here we see the um, trochlea of the humerus and the trochlear notch, which is going to have this divot in it that will receive the trochlea of the humerus. Um, we see the articular cartilage there to remind you of the features of a synovial joint. Here's the synovial cavity with the fluid. In green is going to be the membrane. Uh, and then we see the um, articular capsule, that density regular connected tissue surrounding the joint there, closing it in. There will also be ligaments, and we see in this illustration tendons of the brachialis muscle here um, anteriorly, and then the tendon of the triceps muscle and uh, posteriorly. And these are showing um, ligaments that are holding everything together. So it's kind of cool. It's like your bones have their own like ace bandages holding these joints steady. All right, now we are going to the lower limbs and we are at the coxal joint or hip joint. This too is a multi-axial ball and socket joint. However, it is way more stable than the shoulder joint. And that's for obvious reasons because um, the hip joint is holding you up on your two legs. So humans are the only animals to truly walk in an upright bipedal position. And this even affects the shape of our spine compared to other vertebrate animals. Other vertebrate animals will have a C-shaped spine and humans will have 
curves. We will have anterior and posterior curves uh, to do shock absorption as we stand upright. So the hip joint is very stable. Um, it has a very deep socket called the acetabulum located on the pelvic bones. It's um, the union of all three, the pubis, the ischium, and the ilium. And the head of the femur, of course, will fit stably in there, and it will be held tightly together by ligaments. So range of motion will be limited, and um, it, will, it will flex and extend the thigh. It will do circumduction. Um, you can abduct and adduct the uh, thigh as well, so basically everything. Um, but it's not going to do it to the degree that the shoulder joint would do because we need a very flexible shoulder joint because we are manipulating the environment. We need to reach up. We need to reach down. We need to reach to the side. You know, you, you understand. All right. So the um, coxal joint is prone to osteoporosis, and it was the first joint for which a prosthesis was developed. So, um the broken hip is generally a fracture of the femoral neck. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. But here we see the femoral neck, and it's, you know, that spongy bone interior. And as mentioned in the previous chapter, osteoporosis affects the spongy bone of the vertebra and the neck of the, and head of the femur, you know, most severely. And so the weight of one's body can, you know, fracture these bones. The very deep acetabulum is pictured here um, as a union between the um, ilium at the top, um, superiorly, ischium inferiorly, and then the pubis would be anterior and medial. Uh, this is the head of the femur. Remember, the head means the proximal part. You can see the epiphysis uh, line there, and then all those features of the synovial joint. The green would be the membrane, the yellow is the fluid, uh, the blue is the articular cartilage. You see ligaments, and then surrounding it would be that articular capsule. Uh, here's some more ligaments that are holding everything together. And, of course, these can most certainly uh, be injured. All right, a couple more. The knee joint, and then we'll do the ankle joint. So, hey, children, knees and toes. So we're reaching it. We're at the knees. So this is the largest, most complex joint in the body. And um, again, it's bearing a lot of weight uh, and knee injuries are very common because, you know, all the pressure and, you know, one wrong movement can tear the soft tissues and then you're just kind of screwed forever. And so this functions as a hinge joint to flex and extend the leg and the Fibular collateral ligament will connect the femur to the fibula and prevents the knee from moving medially. And then the tibial collateral ligament will connect the femur to the tibia and prevents the knee from moving laterally. And um, this is also connected to the medial meniscus of the knee. I've got an uh, injury for that one from years of swimming and doing breaststroke and all that good stuff and kicking my knees out, you know, um, laterally and again like I said to this day I have uh, issues and have to be really careful when exercising but I need to keep exercising to keep that muscle tone but I just have to be aware and uh, it hurts and pops a lot um, and so then we see the meniscus a lot of people tear that and um, that's ouchy because it like the ligaments doesn't really heal itself and so you know, you just kind of have to deal with it or get surgery. So the point of the medial and lateral meniscus is to add stability to the knee joint. And interiorly, there are two ligaments, the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate. The uh, cruciate means to cross, and so these are going to cross over each other. And the anterior cruciate ligament will prevent hyperextension of the knee and the posterior cruciate ligament will prevent hyperflexion of the knee. And so, of course, it is more common to hyperextend and hurt yourself. And so the anterior cruciate ligament is very commonly injured. And, of course, surgery would be necessary to fix it or else one will just have to deal with it. Um, so these are going to be some of the results of a lateral blow to the knee. 
It will tear the tibial collateral ligament, the medial meniscus, and the anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament and the meniscus can also be torn when changing directions too quickly while running or from an anterior blow to the knee. Arthroscopic surgery is a successful treatment and the patellar ligament can be used to repair the ACL. It can also use um, ligaments and stuff from cadavers. Uh, tissues such as ligaments and things like that are easy to transplant because since they're not vascular, your body is not going to necessarily reject it because there's no blood and things like that for your own body to freak out about. And that's true with like corneal transplants in the eye and stuff and, and like cataracts and stuff. Like you can get lenses and stuff without um, issue generally. All right. Uh, so in this illustration, we see the anterior view of the right knee. So to orient you, the thigh is superior here, and you can see the quadriceps muscles. There's a tendon there that is connecting to the patella, um, and then from the patella to the uh, tibial tuberosity down here, this is the um, patellar ligament. And then the lateral part is going to have the fibula over here. So this would be the fibular collateral ligament connecting femur to fibula and then medially over here featured on the right is the tibial collateral ligament and that is um, connecting the femur to the tibia. And then here we see the cruciate ligament. You can see how they cross which is that cruciate there. So the anterior cruciate ligament extends towards the front of the knee for anterior, and the posterior cruciate ligament travels and extends towards the back of the knee, hence posterior. You can see the meniscus here that has been cut so that you can show the um, cruciate ligaments deep to it. This is a good picture too. You see lots of the bursa fat pads and things like that that help support this joint. Uh, this is a good picture of the meniscus. The, uh, let's see, this is anterior. So then the one on the left here would be medial and the one on the right would be lateral. And then here you see the cruciate ligaments, posterior moving towards the back of the knee and the anterior moving towards the front of the knee and they cross. Here is a knee injury showing the lateral blow to the knee. And you all are familiar with the concept of, um, you know, uh, blow type injuries causing issues on the opposite side of the body where the blow occurred. Uh, so in this case, you see this hockey puck coming in and sure it's gonna bruise and hurt the lateral side of the knee, but the shock waves and the extreme stretching that occurs on the opposite side as a result of this lateral blow is enough force to tear these ligaments and these tendons. Um, and I know that that can occur with a blow to the head too, like with the uh, duramater, um, how, you know, where of course the blow occurs can be an injury, but oftentimes there is opportunity for injury on the opposite side as the brain whacks into um, the skull. All right, last joint is the talocrural joint. So remember, crural means the um, anterior lower leg, and then I believe sural is the posterior lower leg, if I'm not wrong. Um, and so the talocrural joint is going to be located anteriorly here. And you can see that the tibia, fibula, and the talus, which is one of your tarsal bones, uh, will articulate. And this will allow for dorsiflexion, pointing the toes towards the sky, and plantar flexion, pointing the toes towards the floor. And so when you stand in your tippy toes, that's a different joint. That's not necessarily the ankle joint in its entirety. Of course, you will be doing plantar flexion. However, um, the joints here between the metatarsals and the phalanges, that one is going to be uh, that fulcrum that will be 
supporting the weight. And here's your little joke. We've got the gingerbread man with a sore knee, and the doctor asks if he's tried to ice it. Her, her. All right. Thanks for listening.